Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to UX Joburg. My name is Jonathan Copeland, and I'm going to be your host this evening. Uh, I'm a UX designer at Sand Dollar Design. I want to help people feel smarter in their day to day lives by building technology that is more accessible. I'm a recent BIS uh, multimedia graduate from the University of Pretoria in South Africa. I'm also the host of the Guidelines podcast, which is a podcast about human centered design within South Africa and beyond. In addition to a love of technology and uh, use experience design, I'm also interested in music. I'm currently listening to an album called Notes on Conditional Form by the 1975, uh, as well as reading a book called The Second Mountain by David Brooks. If you guys want to get in touch with me, you can reach out to me on Twitter at JM Copel, uh, and you can reach out to me about anything to do with UX or music or books. And if you guys have any book recommendations, please drop them in the chat below. Alrighty, so moving into the uh, moving into the evening, we have there are going to be three broad sections to this meetup today. There's going to be a theoretical component, a practical component, as well as a networking section. In the theory component, that's going to last about 20 minutes. And in that stage, we're going to listen to a customer journey mapping masterclass from our speaker. Now, during that part, the most important thing really is going to be whether you is to follow UX Joburg on Twitter and then tweet any insights and questions that you have that come up using hashtag UX Joburg. After we're done with the theoretical component, we're going to move into the practical part of the evening, where we're going to apply everything that we've learned in the theory part. In the practical, we're going to apply what we've learned, and all of us are going to work together to create a customer journey map of our own. We're going to be using an app called Miro to do this, and for 20 minutes, we're going to work together, and Yaku is going to, our speaker is going to talk us through every step of that process. And wrapping the evening up, we're going to do some networking. One of the best things about uh, coming to meetups is meeting people within your industry who are doing work similar to you. And that's what we're going to try and recreate here. Uh, we're going to connect members of the UX Joburg community. Uh, and we're going to do that by opening up the UX Joburg meetup page and where we can send private messages. That's going to be about 15 minutes. So we'll give you instructions on how to do that close to the time. Now, the glue that's going to be bringing all of these things together is going to be Q&A sections. And those, the, those, the UX Joburg Twitter channel that I mentioned earlier, at UX Joburg and hashtag UX Joburg, that's going to be the space from which we're going to be getting all your questions and then relaying them to our speaker. So uh, after the theory component, we're going to have a five-minute Q&A. Uh, and then after the... Uh, after the practical component, we're also going to have one final Q&A section. So if you have any comments that you'd like to get through to the speaker or questions that you'd like answered in the session, please reach out to us on Twitter. We've asked for your input to help shape the future of UX Joburg. And here are the results of our recent survey. There were 57 respondents. From those 57, 73% would prefer evening meetings between 5 and 9. 65% would prefer meetings of one hour, 28% would prefer meetings of 1.5 hours, one and a half. The most popular topics were UX strategy, design thinking, customer journey mapping, UX design in specific industries, as well as user research. This evening's talk is going to be on customer journey mapping. Some admin, UX Joburg was going to be continuing virtually for the next couple of months due to COVID-19. So you're welcome to reach out to us on Twitter if you have any feedback or need more topics that you'd like to discuss going forward. This session is going to be recorded and it will be available. We'll share that on our, on our Twitter channel afterwards. So if there's anything that you'd like to miss or go over, or if you've missed or you'd like to go over again, please refer back to our Twitter page and you'll be able to find links from there. So what would a meetup be without a prize? And this evening, we have a really good prize. And this is going to be for the most engaging questions and posts on Twitter. So every question that you submit to us on Twitter, every insight that you share from the theoretical or the practical component, that's going to go towards adding you as a possibility of winning this prize. And the prize is going to be uh, the usability experience, the ultimate guide to usability in UX by David Travis. And this is a Udemy course. It's valued at over 2,000 Rand, and we're going to give you, uh, we're going to gift that course to the winner of tonight's event. 
uh, this course is a is an incredibly good course. It's the highest rated UX course on Udemy, uh, and it's also been updated for 2020. Uh, you'll get a certificate on completion, and one of the best things about this course is that it's project driven. So you'll be just like tonight's event. You're going to be learning theoretical stuff, and then you're going to be applying it and and sharing it with uh, David Travis. One of the amazing things is uh, I've been working through this course, and uh, David Travis is so engaging on Twitter, and actually you can share your insights with him, and he'll actually engage with you on the work that you've done. So it's a really interactive, high-quality course. So send those messages on Twitter, and you stand a chance of winning this. You may have noticed that UX Joburg has a, a fresh new look, but along with that new look, UX Joburg also has some new management. Uh, before we move on to the future, though, we'd like to look back and say thank you so much to William Saunders. William, are you here? If William's here, maybe we can unmute him. If he's not, we can, uh, we can move ahead. Okay, so we'll... Uh, We'll just say thank you, Jim. So William Saunders started UX Joburg back in 2012. That was seven years ago. Now, running anything for seven years is no small feat, let alone successfully building one of the most successful meetups within South Africa. William, you have set us up for success uh, and established UX Joburg as a resource for current and future generations of South African designers. We thank you so much. Uh, for the way that you've invested into the design community within South Africa. If you'd like to get in touch with William, feel free to reach out to him on Twitter uh, or Xperio's website, uh, the company that William owns is Xperio. Is that you, William? Okay. Yeah. Um, so if you'd like to get in touch with William, please reach out to him on Twitter or Xperio, and you can actually find a link to his Twitter in the show notes. And we're going to, yeah. With that, I'd like to, it is my privilege to introduce Yaku van den Hierfer. Yaku is uh, tonight's speaker. Yaku has been working in the UX design industry for over 13 years, leading design teams at companies such as Standard Bank and Vodacom. He's also completed an MBA at Witz Business School in 2013. Three years ago, he left corporate life and started Sand Dollar Design, an experienced design and product innovation consulting firm. His latest venture is mybloodtest.co.za, an online blood testing service disrupting the pathology industry through a digital health platform to improve their patient experience. Yaku, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, can you hear me? Can I hand over to you? Uh, yes, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Are you able to hear me? Yes, wonderful. You sound good. Okay, great. So, hi, everyone. It's really a Great um, evening to be here with all of you. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces from all over the world, so thank you guys for joining me. And I look forward to sharing with you a little bit tonight about uh, my experience in the field of um, UX and specifically customer journey mapping. So over the last decade or so, I have um, consulted at various companies and I've presented kind of many journey mapping workshops and many journey mapping deliverables. So I'm hoping to just share a little bit of practical experience around that with you tonight. Be checking in whether the screens are displaying properly. Jonathan, is it all displaying fine? Yeah, it's all looking great on our side. Okay, perfect. So we're going to start off um, the kind of theoretical component tonight by just looking at what is a customer journey map. So a customer journey map is a visual representation of the customer experience with your organization. And it tells the story of the experience from cradle to grave. So from when the customer initially learns about your brand and starts getting awareness of your company to when they actually start interacting with you, when they purchase a product or when they actually take up your service and up to a long-term relationship in the ideal world or alternatively when they exit or stop using your products or services. So 
It also provides insights into your customers' motivations, needs, and pain points, and we do customer journey maps um, as a strategic level tool so that we can create awareness and alignment across the organization so that people actually understand what the real customer experience is with your brand and with your organization, and so that everyone around the table in a company can actually do their best to help and improve the customer experience. So you might ask yourself then, as a UX designer, how does a journey map actually help you? So what value does it actually add to you in the design process? And how does it create value for the organization? So the first thing that a journey map does is that it helps you to understand all the different touch points that a customer, a user can interact with, uh, with your organization, and also where those handovers can happen between channels. Um, so in many cases, a UX designer might only be responsible for designing a certain channel, or maybe you're responsible for designing the app, but the company also has a website, it also has physical stores, it also has a call center, and you need to understand what all those touch points are because many times a customer won't only interact with your organization in a single touch point. So you need to make sure by understanding all these touch points and where the handovers happen, what the real experience is and where do you actually need to create some consistency and alignment between these different touch points and channels. The next thing that a journey map does is it helps you to identify the areas that need attention. Um, so when we go through the construct of a journey map, you'll see that there's specific things where we try and identify things like pain points. We look at metrics and those things help you to actually focus on what are your biggest problem areas. Um, and that's typically where you can solve the biggest pain points for your customers but also where some of the low-hanging fruits might lie, things that you can actually fix quickly and easily and get a lot of positive uplift out of that. The next thing that it does is to help identify areas that are actually doing well. So it's also important to know what's working as much as knowing what isn't working. So when things are working, the idea is not to change it, but obviously there's also room for improvement um, in any case. And the next thing that you um, typically want to do with a journey map or how it helps you is kind of the whole reason why you're doing it is to identify the opportunities for improvement. So going through a journey mapping exercise should ultimately lead to you coming up with lots of ideas of how you can actually improve the customer experience. And lastly, journey maps are an extremely valuable tool in improving the understanding and communication that you have across teams. Um, and this is also one of the factors in terms of how you actually facilitate journey maps, um, is that you actually have to bring people from across the organization together to co-create these journey maps, and that then creates that improved understanding and communication across the whole team. Okay, so when you do journey mapping, there's a couple of different perspectives or angles that you can come at them. So um, the first way that you can look at a journey map is to look at the current state. Um, so the current state is where you're looking at what is the customer experience today and what is working and what is not working with it in the current state. The alternative to the current state is looking at the future state journey map. So when you do a future state journey mapping exercise, you're actually mapping out the ideal customer experience or the ideal customer journey that you would like the experience to be. And what this then becomes is kind of your two opposite ends of your roadmap. So if you know what your current state is and how the current state looks, what's wrong and what's working well, and you know what your future state looks like, you can then start mapping out a roadmap of improvements to get from your current state to your future state. The other perspective that you can bring into journey mapping is also the level of granularity. So typically when you do customer journey mapping, it's done more at a high strategic level and you look at the entire customer journey across the whole life cycle of a customer with your organization. So that's done kind of at a high helicopter level view. 
and you're looking really to highlight the main pain points and the main things that are working well when you're doing that. But in other instances, you might actually zone in on one specific step of the customer journey. So you might go and focus really deeply on, for example, just the buying step of the process where the person is actually making a purchase. And you can really go into detail and low level detail and get a lot of granular data. Um, so it's just important to know when you're doing it, which level you're doing it at and how detailed you want to go. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you through a couple of components of a good customer journey map. Um, so this is based on my own experience over the last decade or a little bit over a decade doing customer journey maps. Uh, if you go and you Google customer journey map, you'll find many examples and many templates um, out there on the internet. And what I've done is I've kind of combined a lot of the elements from different templates and examples um, and basically put together a guideline of stuff that I've practically found to work very well. So I'm sure there's areas that I might not cover, but I feel pretty confident that this is a very good kind of structure and template that you can use um, for your journey maps going forward. So the first thing that we put into a journey map is the steps in the process or the customer lifecycle phases. So this isn't always exactly the steps that you're seeing on your screen now. Um, you'll have to define this for each organization and for each product and service, but it typically follows quite a similar pattern if you're looking at the entire customer lifecycle. And the steps in the process you typically place horizontally um, at the top of your customer journey map, uh, whether you're doing a, kind of a whiteboard facilitation exercise or whether you're creating a customer journey map deliverable in some kind of a design tool. Um, so the steps that you've got at the top will typically cover the following uh, parts of the customer life cycle. So you've got the awareness phase, and this is where someone kind of learns about your product or service or learns about your brand. The next step is explore, where they have become interested and are actually starting to investigate and look at what the options are and almost getting to that decision of purchasing your product or service. So the next step is the buy step in the process, and that's the actual purchasing step. Um, so that would include stuff like check out if it's an online process, um, adding your credit card details, those kind of things. And once the customer has bought the product or service, they would then typically be onboarded or they might actually receive a physical product or a service or they might download something. So there's always that kind of onboarding or delivery aspect. And then the next step is when they actually start using your product. So in an ideal world, they'll just use the product, love the product and be happy. But as we all know, when people start using products and services, many times they actually need support or service to help them through that. So that's where we look at those aspects. And then lastly, we typically have a step for renewing, which means they'll either like upgrade the product or service or they continue using it, or alternatively, they might leave um, your services or your company as a customer. So those are typically the steps, but um, it can actually be different depending on what type of business you're in. So this is kind of a guideline, but it can definitely be tailored to suit different types of businesses and different customer journeys. The next aspect that makes for a good customer journey map is to start unpacking what is the process within each of these steps. So all the elements that I'm gonna go through now will actually do for each of the steps in the customer life cycle. So if you're thinking about your deliverable, this is actually the rows now going down below the customer journey life cycle steps. So for each of those steps, you will then ask yourself and in the sessions that you're facilitating, you will document what is the process that's actually followed to conduct the step in the customer life cycle. So for example, if it is um, uh, online food ordering service, the first step will be that you will go and search on the internet. So you're basically trying to find out what's available. 
The next element that we put into the journey map is looking at what are the customer needs and questions at this step in the customer life cycle. So that's where you ask yourself, what does the customer actually think during this phase of the life cycle? What are the typical questions that they have um, about the step in the process? What are the things that they're unsure of? Or what are the things that they're thinking? Maybe they've got fears. Maybe they've got certain drivers that might motivate them to actually purchase the product. So it's important to document those things. And I'll touch on it a little bit later in the talk. But all of these things should ideally be based on data and research. Um, so it's important to actually base it on data and research and get people in the room when you're creating this that will bring in good, solid insights and experience in these various aspects. So the next thing we look at are the different customer touch points. So this is where we start saying um, in which way is it possible for the customer to interact with your organization during this phase of the life cycle. And then you start looking at all the various channels like your website, your mobile app, your call center, USSD, SMS, WhatsApp chats. Do you have a store where they can go in person? Do you have agents that go out into the field? Um, do you use email communications? So all of these various as touch points, you would then actually document uh, um, so full idea of how it's actually possible to interact with your organization at this step. When you're looking at a future state, you would obviously then define what are the ideal touch points that you want to use. The next aspect that you bring into your customer journey map is experience metrics. So this is typically only going to be available if you are an existing organization and you are running a lot of um, customer metrics in your actual channels. So the example that you're seeing on the screen, this question, how likely are you to recommend this to someone? Um, this is the NPS question. Um, so it basically gives you an NPS rating. And if you've got this kind of data available, if you've got this kind of data available, from your touch points, you can then start plotting across your customer journey. Where is it actually going well? Where are there good metrics and where are there not such good metrics that you can focus on to actually then improve the experience um, in those areas where it's not going well? Um, it's also important just to note that um, you can't always compare metrics across the customer lifecycle with each other. So um, as an example, when um, I worked for a telecommunications company in the past, we used to see much higher NPS scores uh, during the buy part of the customer journey um, when people are either taking out a contract or when they're purchasing things like data or airtime compared to when they're doing things like servicing um, or when they're just browsing. Um, and the reason for that is that there's actually a whole emotional experience attached to purchasing something successfully, um, and that would immediately like raise those scores, even if the experience of that is kind of at the same level as the support. It's just the emotional element does play quite a big role in that. So you always have to also take these things with a pinch of salt. Okay, so the next element that we typically cover in a customer journey map is pain points. So this is where you want to identify what are currently the things that are really irritating the customers or that they're really struggling with and the things that you really want to make sure you can fix when you're putting any new designs or experience improvements in place. Um, and for this, you typically use things like um, actual research data where you go out and you speak to the users to get the data, or you can use things like call center logs to see what the most common complaints are in the call center or maybe in your stores. Um, you can get people from the front lines to actually also participate in these sessions and they can tell you what the biggest pain points are for the existing customers. And those pain points are typically the things by solving those, you would then create a great experience for your users. 
The next aspect that we consider as part of the customer journey map is competitors. So the idea here is that for every step of the life cycle, you want to highlight some of the key things that your competitors are actually getting right. Um, and that will also help you to identify where do you need to match your competitors or where can you actually do things that are better than your competitors. So the idea isn't that you just go into a journey mapping session and just off the top of your head shoot out a couple of ideas of what competitors are doing well and not doing so well. You should actually be doing proper competitor analysis um, as part of the normal UX design process, part of the normal research that you do. Um, but you should bring those insights into your customer journey map as well. Okay, so next we also consider what are the barriers. So barriers are typically those things like laws, um, compliance reasons, technological stuff that's basically stopping you from delivering the best possible experience. So um, it might be that you've got this amazing idea that you want people to fly in suits from Africa to America in 10 hours. But Logically, that's just not possible. So that's a barrier that obviously you won't overcome quite soon. But in each business, you find this technology might not be there yet to do the things that you want to do. Um, and it's also very important to have people from a compliance and a legal um, aspect to contribute to your journey maps. Because many times you've got great ideas of things that you want to do, but there's laws like data privacy, um, and things like that. There might be legislation in your country that prohibits you from doing certain things. So it's critical to identify those and also document them as part of your journey map. And sometimes by documenting those, you actually come up with ideas of how to actually solve problems in a different way that's a bit more creative um, despite those barriers. And many times creativity actually comes out of being constrained quite a lot. Okay, so the next aspect that we cover in a good customer journey map is to identify the moments of service, moments of intimacy, and moments of truth. So moments of service are those steps in the customer life cycle that customers are basically expecting to work kind of like clockwork. So for example, if you are working, or if you are using a cell phone network, your expectation is that you can make calls and your phone can connect to data and you're able to browse the web on your phone. That's like the basic service that you're expecting. If those moments of service are failing, so if you want to make a call but you can't connect to the network or if you're trying to get onto the internet on your phone and it doesn't connect, that is a very negative experience. So moments of service have a very big negative downside so it's important to know which are your moments of service and to make sure that those are the ones that work 100% of the time. And if there's any chance that they might fall over, to have a very quick recovery uh, for that. So heavy monitoring and things like that in place to make sure that it works. If you get your moments of service right, it's not actually a big positive upside. That's the minimum expectation that a customer has when they're interacting with your organization, is that the moments of service should work. The next level of interaction is called moments of intimacy. Moments of intimacy is those one or two moments throughout the customer lifecycle where you as an organization might know something almost more personal about your customer and if you use it in the right way, you can actually create a positive emotional response. So an example of that might be that a person goes to a bank, he arrives at the bank teller, and the bank teller logs into his profile, and he sees it's this guy's birthday, and he says, like, hey, Mr. Johnson, happy birthday. We're so glad you came here, and he has a nice chat with the customer. That creates a positive emotional effect for the customer, and the moments of intimacy don't really have a lot of negative downside. So the risk is a bit lower in terms of doing negative downside, unless you're doing something that's a bit creepy. 
but typically things like knowing a birthday or knowing like what's your wife's name and asking about your family and things like that when you're starting to build relationships with your customers, those things build intimacy. So if you can identify one or two moments like that in the customer life cycle, you can actually create great loyalty and intimacy with your customer. And the last level is moments of truth. So moments of truth is the one or two key moments throughout the entire customer life cycle that will ultimately define the way that they see the experience. So it's the, let's think of the moment when you've purchased an Xbox and it's arrived at your house and you plug it in and it's connected to your internet and you fire it up and you're ready to go. If the Xbox gives you a nice welcome screen and it's easy to set up and you can just get going and start playing, that moment of truth worked. But if it fails at that step, it's quite a negative downside. So it's very important for all your different products and services to know where that moment of truth is and to absolutely make sure that those things are working. Okay, and then ultimately, the reason why we do all these things that I've just mentioned. So everything from looking at the process, the pain points, the customer needs and motivations, the barriers, the competitors, all of these things we do in order to trigger ideas of how we can actually improve the experience. So as you go through this process of doing all those steps, you will actually start having these light bulb moments going off in your head and you'll start identifying design ideas. And that's ultimately why we are doing this journey mapping exercise. So at the end of the process, the last step is then to start documenting all your design ideas that get triggered by going through all these other steps. So one of the key things with a customer journey mapping workshop is not to be too critical or negative um, you're trying to get as many ideas there as possible. And once you've put them down, you can always have another session where you actually start looking at feasibility and priority and actually saying which of these things can go onto your roadmap for implementation. The idea is not to try and be too critical in the sessions when you're doing customer journey mapping so that you can get lots of ideas flowing because many times one idea actually leads to another idea from another person and another idea that follows on that. Um, so it's really also super important not to be too negative or critical about ideas that people are putting together. Okay, so those are the unique components of creating a good customer journey map. And we're going to go through a practical exercise shortly where we're going to co-create a journey map for a specific business just to get a bit of practical experience and feeling of how that works. But there's a couple of small aspects that I just wanted to discuss before we get into the practical. So the first one is a common question that I get um, is what are all the different terminology and buzzwords that's being used um, for customer journey maps um, in the industry. So there's a lot of different words that people use and sometimes they use them incorrectly and some people kind of use these words interchangeably. So common words related to customer journey mapping that um, I typically hear is user journey, customer journey, journey maps, um, words like task flows. Um, so from my experience and from all the research that I've done about customer journey mapping, the format that I've just covered is the correct format for a customer journey map. And it's a more strategic kind of high level overview of the entire customer life cycle. Um, what I've seen being used in the UX design industry specifically is something that people call a user journey. And what in most cases, what I've seen this is that it's more like almost a screen flow or step-by-step -step detailed process of what the user is doing on a specific system. Um, so personally, I call that a screen flow diagram or a task flow. Um, and that's a much more detailed granular kind of level of the customer journey and typically only covers a small part of the overall customer journey. Um, I think maybe the key thing to communicate here is that um, if someone asks you 
to do as a deliverable, a user journey or a customer journey or a task flow is to actually just chat to them and confirm what their expectation is. Are they expecting this high level kind of overarching customer journey of the entire customer life cycle? Or do they want you to actually map out this one specific process of how a user will do this on a specific channel? Um, if you do that, then you shouldn't run into any problems. So just make sure what it is that your stakeholder actually wants from you. Okay, so as we went through all those um, aspects of what makes up a good journey map, um, you would have probably seen that in order to do it well, you're going to need a lot of inputs and the idea is that you will actually use the deliverables from following a proper user-centered design process. So to create a good journey map, you're going to need lots of data. You can use things like your customer personas. So if you understand who your different users are, what their needs are, what different tasks are that they do, their goals and motivations, you can then think about those personas as you are going through the customer journey map, and you can then start making sure that you're actually covering all the different users when you're doing that exercise. The next thing is that you actually should use insights from customer research. So anyone in the UX design industry knows that you need to spend time with customers, you need to interview them, you need to observe them in order to really understand them. So those are the things that you actually need in order to create a good journey map. If you have access to customer experience metrics, that's great, and it will really help you to almost quantify the different steps in your current customer experience. Um, so this is where we look at things like net promoter score, customer effort score, and customer satisfaction score, or any other feedback mechanisms that you have where customers give you feedback about the process. The next one is that we want to get cross-functional perspectives. So this isn't about a team of UX designers getting together and mapping out their version of the customer journey. The idea is that you're actually bringing the whole organization or representatives from different areas of the organization together to give you all the different perspectives from each of the functions in the business. So you want to get people from customer service because they are the ones actually dealing with customers face to face. You want to get people from product because they're the ones that have ideas about features and business rules. You want to get the business decision makers because they typically make decisions that can impact the customer experience. The design team is obviously critical and the technology team is especially good at telling us what the barriers are and what can't be done, but we definitely need to get their perspective as well. And then lastly, compliance, legal, um, that perspective is also critical to make a good customer journey map. So one of the core things of creating a good customer journey map is the journey mapping workshop. Um, and what I would recommend for doing a proper journey mapping workshop is to really take a day out of the office, get everyone together. Um, it's not that you'll necessarily spend eight hours but you probably at least need about four hours, maybe four to six hours um, of real solid thinking time. So if you can book a whole day out and get everyone to book out their diaries for the day, put some nice breaks in between. And then it's very important when you do the workshop to get everybody's input. And this is done through a good facilitator. Um, so what you typically find in any room is that there's some people that are more extroverted and some that are more introverted. The extroverts typically kind of take over any conversation. Um, they want to be heard. They want to give an opinion about other people's inputs. Um, so what a good facilitator does is to make sure that everyone actually gives their input. And one of the ways that you can do that is by following what we call a faucet versus a funnel approach. So a faucet is basically when you open up the taps and you let the water run as quickly as possible. So the way that you do that is to actually get your audience in your workshop to each sit and individually first identify their ideas and thoughts. So give them each a pile of sticky notes and when you're looking at pain points on a certain step, you first ask everyone 
to sit on their own and map out their own ideas about the pain points individually. And once you've done that, that's the faucet step, then you start going into a funnel approach where people then start putting their ideas on the board and then you'll start seeing, okay, we've got some duplicates. So obviously there's a strong theme here and you can start grouping those duplicates together to show that it's a strong theme. And that way you're actually likely to get much more inputs from everybody. And typically what you'll find is that a lot of intelligent people with great ideas might be more reserved. So this approach does help to get their ideas and inputs as well. Um, the other thing that you can do as part of your workshop is to allocate a user persona to each participant. So you, if you have user personas, it might even be a good idea to create user personas if you don't for a journey mapping workshop. Um, and you can actually tell each person in the room Here's a persona that I want you to think about as we go through this process today. So you can think about yourself, but also think about this persona and what they might think at each of these different steps. And that way you can also make sure that you've got good coverage of your different personas in your journey map. And lastly, um, it's just about the facilitation. Timekeeping is critical. So um, as you'll see, we're going to look at a practical board now. A journey map has a lot of steps that you need to work through. So you need to be really strong on your timekeeping and facilitation is definitely going to be necessary because what you find is that as soon as someone volunteers an idea, other people that want to start debating those ideas. And the idea with journey mapping is not to debate every single idea that comes up. It's more to get the ideas out there and you can always critically evaluate it outside of the journey mapping workshop itself. The last thing to do is to document your journey map. So if you're doing a journey mapping workshop on a whiteboard and you've got lots of sticky notes up, um, you can take pictures, you can actually get someone to sit in the session and take notes as you're going through it. Um, so many times what we want to do is to create a visual journey map in a tool and it's also good if you can get someone to start capturing the things as the workshop is happening. And that's where tools actually also comes in. So there's a lot of tools out there. I'm not going to focus a lot on the, the available tools, but anything from whiteboards in the actual sessions that you're facilitating, uh, two things like PowerPoint, um, Papilio is a new tool that's been launched in South Africa, um, Smaply, Miro, Canvanizer, Cust Excellence, there's a whole lot of tools that's available. Each of them has their pros and their cons. Um, so I think especially now with everyone working remotely, these um, online tools are going to become more popular for things like journey mapping. And uh, we're going to practically try out Miro um, as part of the session today, so you'll get a good feeling of how that works. But remember, when it comes to tools, a fool with a tool is still a fool. It's not really about the tool, it's about the process and understanding what the purpose is of all the components of a customer journey map. So the tool isn't going to make a good customer journey map or not. You must still follow the correct approach in creating your customer journey map regardless of which tool you're using. Okay, we're going to hand over to Jonathan now, and we're going to have a look at a couple of questions that people have posted on the Twitter channel. All right, Jaku, thank you for that concise breakdown of customer journey maps. Before we move on to the practical component of this evening's meeting, we'll go through our first Q&A. And the first question that I'm going to ask you is from Jessica LaRue, and she says on Twitter, I strongly feel all customer journey maps should be backed by both primary and secondary research, as Yaku has stated. I would just like to find out what you believe is the best way to gather primary research, whether that is through user interviews, surveys, or focus groups. Cool. Thanks, Jessica. That's a great question. So, um, Personally, I believe that um, the best form of user research is um, by doing primary research in the field. So both interviews and observations. Um, over many years of experience, I've just seen a lot of value in doing interviews and observations. Uh, focus groups, 
I'm very skeptical about. Um, focus groups are very popular in the marketing kind of spheres, and they use typically where you almost want to get a couple of people to rubber stamp something that you've already decided you want to do. Um, so with focus groups, you typically get kind of a group thinking mentality. So I'd, I'm definitely not a fan of focus groups unless you have a very specific way of facilitating the focus group that will make sure that you're not getting groupthink mentality in the focus group. So um, I would say definitely interviews and observations is the way to go. Um, and if you can get any secondary research, so um, if you are looking at things like where the pain points are, then you can definitely get things like, you know, what are the most common complaints in the call center or in the stores? Um, that, that form of data you probably won't find in the kind of direct interviews, um, or you might just get very anecdotal evidence. But if you're looking at real quantified um, pain points and things like that, the secondary data is very useful there. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Yaku. The next question we have is by at one of the gooses on Twitter, and it says, in today's busy, busy, busy virtual world, how do you go about getting buy-in from the various stakeholders needed to craft a useful customer journey? Stakeholders, stakeholders are as busy as we are. How do we position this to them as a priority worth their time? Yes, yeah, so that's, I think, not just around customer journey mapping, but probably um, everything around the value of UX design and for people to buy into the value process. So what I always team and what I've always tried to practice is to show people the value small increments at a time. And as you show them the value in small increments, they start buying in more and more into the different activities that you do. So let's say if you do want to do customer journey mapping, but um, your stakeholders don't see the value in taking a whole day out um, to spend with you, what you could do is to actually break it up into smaller sessions and maybe just tell them, okay, can we maybe spend one hour together and then we'll only cover one of the steps in the customer journey life cycle. And if they start seeing the value in that exercise, if you're facilitating it well and you're getting good um, output out of it, then they might buy more into it and start making themselves available more so that you can then map out the entire journey with them. Okay, that's valuable. Thank you, Yaku. We're now going to move on to the practical component of this evening. So could you move to the next slide, Yaku? Okay, so Yaku, would you like to give us an overview on how the practical is going to work? And then you can show everyone that video that's going to detail how people can join. Okay, so um, we are going to be creating a, a one of the steps in a customer journey map for um, order in so order in is a food delivery platform it's a competitor of the likes of uber eats and mr delivery and what we're going to be doing is as a group of people we're going to be completing the explore phase in the customer life cycle for this food delivery service so um, i'll be sharing my screen and we're going to jump into miro and all of you will be able to access the miro board by getting the link in the chat um, on this uh, Teams meeting. Uh, so we've got a little video that's just going to show you how to get to it. <clears throat> okay, so you just click on Show Conversation, and the second point from the important links is going to be the Miro link. You're just going to click it, and that's going to take you right away uh, to the Miro board. After a bit of load up, this is what you'll see. Okay, shall we move ahead with that, Jaku? Yes, let's do that. So if everyone can start clicking on the link in the chat, um, I'm going to be going with my screen into Myra as well, just to show you. Okay, wow. so I'm seeing Look at all that. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> okay, so as you can see in Myro, you've um, basically got this board where everyone is able to kind of see each other and we're going to collaborate to create a customer journey map. And what we'll be doing is we're going to be going through the explore step in the customer journey 
for order in. So it's this food delivery business. So we thought that um, with the current corona lockdown prices, this is something quite topical. Hopefully everyone has had an experience using a food delivery service. So the explore step is where the customer is at the point of kind of deciding what it is they want. They're already aware, so they know about the service, but they're now looking at kind of what's available on the service and they're exploring the different options that are available, understanding the service and how it works. But it's not actually the buy process itself. So it's not kind of the adding to your cart and the checkout process yet. So you can zoom in and out of the Miro board. So I'm zooming into the explore step right now and we'll be panning kind of in and out um, as we go through the, the process tonight. So we'll be going through these steps in the process that I've just explained to everybody um, in the theoretical component one by one and we'll actually have about three minutes on each of the steps and we'll go through the process, customer needs, touch points, metrics, pain points, barriers, competitors, and lastly, we'll start getting design ideas. So I'll facilitate this, I'll give you guidance, and what you can do then is you can go on the left, you'll see there's a little toolbar, and there's item on the left called sticky note. And if you click and drag a sticky note, you can just drop it into any of those um, boxes under the explore column and you can then type in. So because we've got hundreds of people actually collaborating, you'll have to zoom in quite a lot to start adding in your ideas and your thoughts. So I'm also going to start a timer so that we can then just make sure we stick into our time. So we're going to go for about 20 minutes and we'll start now. Okay, so the first step we're going to look at in the explore process is what is the process? So how does it actually work in the explore process? So what's the steps we've got? So feel free to drop in a sticky note over there. I'm going to give you about three minutes to do that. And then I'll just wrap up the different ideas that people have added to the board. So just keep in mind, we are looking at the explore. So for example, I see someone has put pay here. So that would probably be more part of the buy process. So I'm actually just going to move that sticky across to the buy process step. Um, so just keep in mind, it will just be the explore phase. And this is quite a common thing that happens in a journey mapping workshop. So nothing wrong with it. And you don't want to shoot down people's inputs. If you identify something as a facilitator that doesn't necessarily fit into that phase of the life cycle, you simply check in with the team and see where you can move that car to. Okay, so we've got some great contributions here. I'm just quickly going to start reading through a couple of them. Well done to everybody. So I see we've got Google search, we've got open the app, log in, create a profile, choose a restaurant, compare prices, select dishes, view specials, do they deliver in my area? So that's probably more a user question that you would um, move that to. So I think you guys can get a good feeling for what fits into this step of the process. 
Okay, so uh, we're going to move on to the next step now, which is looking at what are the customer needs and thoughts. So this is basically like what are the questions that a customer will typically ask in this explore phase of the process. So go ahead, grab a couple of sticky notes and plonk down the ideas that you think, thoughts, the questions, um, the concerns that customers might have at this point in time. Okay, so let's start reading through a couple of them. Um, cool, list of restaurants. What do I want to eat? What are the delivery fees? Um, what's the price? Is it value for money? Do they deliver it to my area? Will I get my food on time? Is the tip included in the price? So it's, I see there's a lot of price, payment methods. Do they have my favorite food? How soon can I get my order? couple of our payment options, do they have daily deals, can I plan my delivery time, is it halal, vegetarian, gluten free, how can I ensure the delivery is doing within social distancing rules, can I earn e-bucks, is it safe, I would like to see the process, will they get my order right, What's the waiting time on orders? Okay, so yeah, I'm starting to see some good trends and lots of common ideas coming up. So yeah, I think we can actually move on to the next one. So the next one is, what are the different touch points? So this is where we now think about what are the different ways that they will be able to interact with the service. So this is a little bit of a theoretical one, but if there's any touch points that you can think about how they could interact with order in as a business, please add them on here. Okay, so we've got mobile app, WhatsApp, website, WeChat, surveys, chatbot, iOS, Android app, the online ordering system, SMS, email, call to collect, chatbot. Okay, so we're starting to see some good trends coming up. So I think we've covered probably most of the possible channels. But it doesn't mean that they will have all these channels, but it's good to identify all these possible channels. Okay, so next up, let's move on to okay, experience metrics. So in this case, we're not actually going to have experience metrics because we don't have any insight or data into what's happening with order in. But this would be where you would add things like what is the NPS rating or the customer effort score if it was being measured, for example, during this phase um, in the app or on the website. So for now, today, we're going to skip over the experience metrics and we're going to move into pain points. So what are the biggest pain points that may be thinking about your own experiences with food delivery services and that you've experienced 
specifically in this explore phase. So it's not to do with the actual delivery and things like that. It's when you are exploring, when you're still considering what to order, what are the pain points that you've experienced there, or what would be common pain points for all the end customers here. Okay, so we've got late delivery, food has gone cold, hard to filter the restaurants, unsanitary staff, inaccurate delivery times, restaurants being offline. Okay, so for example, um, spilled drinks and late delivery would actually fit a little bit more into the actual um, kind of delivery step. So that would actually be moved into the next step next to buy. So we've got in our customer journey map, we've got explore, buy, receive order. So receive order is where you actually receive the delivery. So in this case, I would actually move those cards um, around the actual delivery to that phase in the life cycle. But again, it's good to get it out now. And you'll see as you start going through more and more of these steps, um, you will identify more things that are actually going across different steps in the life cycle. Okay, so let's have a look at some more. Okay, so we've got no vegetarian options, no ice cream, can't determine the delivery fee, discount not applied at checkout, no cutlery, Price is too competitive or expensive. Menu difficult to navigate. Slow app. Website is not responsive. The colors used in the menu is hard to read. Inflated prices. Wonder if I close the app by mistake, will my order be canceled? Can't find what I need. No images of food. Struggling to find restaurant for specific dietary needs. Cool. So I see there's lots of pain points, and I think all of us probably experienced some of these in the last month or two after we've been able to order some food. Okay, so next one we're going to look at is barriers. So what are the legal barriers? What are the techno technological barriers that we need to think about when we are designing this customer experience? So. Um, I see there's already an example of COVID-19 compliance, which is obviously very relevant. But what other barriers are there in terms of making this a fantastic experience? So let's take another two minutes or so to add our ideas for barriers. So, yeah, okay, I just have a question that's come through from one of our listeners. Um, what's been asked is that, is the map we're making now a current or a future state customer journey map? Um, so, this is more of a current state journey map. Sorry, I should have kind of said that up front. But, um, mm. yeah, because it's, you know, it's obviously a bit theoretical. It's not an actual business that any one of us um, are working for. So um, we don't need to be like too critical about the stuff we put in here. So um, whether you're thinking about current or futuristic stuff, it's not a big problem. I think the idea is more just to experience the different elements that are going into a journey map. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. That's great. Thanks, Yaku. Okay, so I'm going to start reading out some of the barriers that people have documented. So we've got um, data privacy, um, struggling with signal on your device, curfew hours, no deliveries after a certain time, don't deliver in my geographical area, low bandwidth users, the limited number of drivers available, um, allergies, have no tracking when food is completed for pickup, 
um, food allergy compliance. It's a theme that's coming through. Um, restaurants not being open. Uh, things being outside the delivery area. Images not loading. It's like a technical um, aspect. No virtual agents to deal with issues on the site. Loading times. New app trying to run on old technology. Weather affects delivery time. Sold out items. Okay, so yeah, we've got some good barriers in there. What we're going to do now is, um, I see one other barrier that's very relevant in South Africa is that the data is expensive. Um, I think another barrier for South Africa that um, has come up in the news lately is that uh, people who are living in informal settlements are not actually willing to pay premium on top of the normal cost of food. Um, so that's why very few of these delivery services are actually um, delivering food into poorer areas. Okay, so next we're going to move into the second last one, which is our competitors. So thinking now about Uber Eats and Mr. D, what are the things that they are doing well that the service order in can actually learn from? Oh, I see there's another one, Deliveroo. Okay, so some of the ideas that are coming from competitors, great marketing, and delivery can track the driver, Uber shows why there's a higher delivery charge, WhatsApp restaurant to reduce delivery fee, tracking drivers, order tracking, so I see that's a big thing coming through, um, option for leave at the door versus meet the driver, and um, we've got integration with Vitality, um, which can give you discounts on your insurance um, because you're ordering healthy food, um, good customer service, offering social distance delivery. Ebenezer shows how the order is being made and delivered, a nice daily discount, relevant promotions, vouchers available, being able to communicate with the drivers, Allow quick discount, ability to choose a custom tip. Sixty minute delivery for checkers. Okay, so we've got some great things that competitors are doing. So now as a final activity of the customer journey mapping process, we're gonna go down to the design ideas. So we'll spend the last three and a half minutes thinking about each of these steps that you went through and maybe thinking about some of the cards that you added to the rows at the top, which design ideas did it trigger? So what are the things that you would actually want to bring into order in to make it a good customer experience in this explore step? So just add your ideas. And sometimes it's literally as simple as, let's say for example, you go and see, okay, in the competitors, there's order tracking. So it's as simple as saying, let's add order tracking as one of the ideas for a design idea. But just going through this process should be triggering lots of ideas of how you can actually improve the service. So let's see what some of those ideas are.
Okay, so we see there's some nice ideas coming up. We've got showing COVID compliance, reward system, offer different delivery options, like leg or curbside delivery, clear navigation, linking with friends to share cost, nice icons and images, adding gamification elements like progress, success screens, rewards, <coughs> show alternatives if a selection is not available, tracking the order, see a rating of a driver, group restaurants according to cuisine, show foods that will deliver sooner, listing your allergies on your profile, integrate with WhatsApp to chat about substitutions, allow for tracking and contacting the delivery person, reorder your favorite dish, order tracking personalization, in-app notifications, explore meals by filtering favorite vegetables or food, chatbot, suggesting specials, allergy options. Okay, awesome. So this has really been a great practical exercise. And I think if anyone involved in the business of order eating or any of these food delivery services were to get their hands on the information in the board, there would definitely be at least a couple of ideas that they could add to their roadmap. So well done to everyone for your contributions. And we're just gonna hand over now again to Jonathan for a final session of QA before we get into our networking activity. Okay, fantastic. I'm gonna share, I'm gonna take over the screen sharing from my end, Yaku. I would like to invite everyone back into Microsoft Teams. So we're running five minutes over time. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to combine our network, our networking phase uh, with our last Q&A, and then we'll wrap things up. Okay, so now that we're done with the practical component, we're going to move into the networking part of our evening. Now, just like with the practical, there's a brief video demo that shows you how you can move from Teams into the networking portal, which is going to be meetup.com. So for now, I'm going to ask you to open up the UX Joburg Meetup page, ensure that you're logged in, and find three, two to three attendees that you haven't met and message them one at a time. We're going to spend over this period about 10 minutes chatting so you can bounce back and forth between those chats throughout this networking session. We can try out some questions which are, for example, where do you work and what is your role? What do you enjoy most about user experience design? And what did you find interesting about the customer journey mapping masterclass? And finally, what is your biggest challenge related to UX design? And here's a video that I spoke about. So all you have to do is open up the chat and you'll see that just like with the Miro board, there's a networking board. So you click on that link and that's gonna open up the page for this particular meetup. And you'll see that on the screen in front of you now uh, that the meetup's showing. Now if you scroll down, You'll see some details about the meetup, but there you'll see the attendees, and you'll, ability, you'll have the ability to see everyone, as well as some featured attendees. In this case, I've clicked on Yaku. You can click on message, and that'll open up a private message between you, you and the attendee that you've selected. Okay, so spend the next 10 minutes finding someone that you'd like to speak to, finding two to three people, drop them a message, and make some new connections. Whilst that happens, I'm going to work through some of the questions that have been sent to us uh, over Twitter during the practical component of this workshop. For now, I'm going to put a, a timer so we know that we're working on time. Right, so we have another nine minutes left, and then we'll move into uh, the final part. Okay. So for now, Yaku, are you ready for another round of Q and A's? Uh, yes, Jonathan, I am. Fantastic. Okay, so our next question is from uh, Hitesh Jinabai. I hope I got that right, Hitesh. Uh, and he says, how do you create a journey map if you have no data? 
For example, if you're launching, if you're launching a brand new app or a software solution, and there is no data that you have about your users, how would you go about um, making a customer journey map for that scenario, Yaku? Um, so the first thing that I would say is that if you are making a new product or service um, without any data, you're probably doing something wrong um, in the first place. So um, if you are in a situation where you've been tasked to do this, um, maybe someone else has the data and you just don't have access to it, um, you can probably you know, start off the process by kind of envisaging what you think a typical user profile would be like, um, making theoretical assumptive personas, um, making lots of assumptions about the underlying needs and goals of the users. But um, it will definitely, in my mind, add a lot of question marks in terms of the validity of any of your design deliverables. Um, so obviously, from a design perspective, you can follow things like best practice and so on. But um, yeah, I don't really believe that any product or service should be conceived in some data, at least from users. Um, and there are lots of low-cost ways that you can actually get data from users. So it doesn't mean that you have to spend months doing research. Um, you might do some guerrilla research where you literally just go out for a few hours, um, chat to people. So um, obviously, you can always spend more time and get higher quality data, but you can always at a low cost, at least get some data to assist in the process. Um, speak to people in the organization that might know about the needs. Um, sometimes we use proxies to, to try and understand the underlying needs and motivations or the pain points. Um, so kind of use what you've got available um, and make the best out of that. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Yaku. Uh, the next question from Twitter is, have you facilitated any virtual or remote workshops? And what are the considerations and differences between a virtual versus an in-person workshop for customer journey mapping? Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of experience uh, doing virtual workshops. Um, so I anticipate that it's going to become much more popular now. Um, and that's why we started exploring tools like Miro and Papilio and and trying to see what the best tool is to actually help us facilitate sessions in these times. Um, so practically, I can't really share any of that um, kind of differences with you. But um, no, I guess in theory, if you're following the correct process, um, probably the biggest challenge would be to get people to really participate and not be distracted. Um, so what you find with remote working is that when you've got sessions, people are Kind of just muting and doing other stuff. Maybe they are busy homeschooling their kids in between. Um, and I think that's probably the biggest challenge is that you might not have their undivided attention for the full session. Okay, that's useful. Thank you, Yaku. It's just a reminder that now we're reaching out to people via the Meetup channel. If you guys have any questions about how to access that, just drop it in the comments section. And then we need more questions come through, we'll move on to that. But so far, we have another five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, Yaku, we actually have another question that's come through. Uh, another one from Hitesh. What he's asked is that, what is the best course to take on user research specifically? Um, so I haven't done a lot of courses on user research um, personally, but um, I believe the David Travis um, course, the one that we're giving away as a prize, um, is actually quite a good course that does go into um, user research a little bit. And... Um, when I started my career in UX, I did a certification um, with human factors, and that was quite useful in terms of covering the theoretical aspects of user research and why it's so important. But um, that was also, I think, about you know, 13, 14 years ago. Um, so 
Apart from that, I've actually just built up my experience with research by reading up a lot, um, following the latest of articles and blog posts of people like Jared Spool, um, following the industry leaders. Um, so I think the best school probably out there is just doing your own research, making sure that you're following people that are credible and that have got great experience. Um, yeah, I wouldn't really be able to say what the best course out there is um, in terms of user research specifically, um, but I'm happy to chat to anyone if they want to get some inputs. Um, if I can help them to define what a good process looks like, I'm more than happy to do that. I think this is a great opportunity to refer to uh, this evening's prize, which is David Travis's uh, UX uh, Masterclass. It's a really great course, and it covers research. Uh, so you can send your, your comments or your questions to us on Twitter. We're going to announce the winner for that competition tomorrow. So just keep an eye on our Twitter page. Uh, we'll post it on our Meetup page as well. So you'll be able to see um, who's won that course. <clears throat> All right, so we've got two minutes left of our networking, and then we'll uh, end off this evening's event uh, with some admin. Just a reminder that you'll be able to find the details uh, from the, the recording of this evening's uh, meetup. You can find it on our Twitter page. We'll post it on a uh, link to it on our meetup page as well. And then you can read over uh, Yaku's slides, hear what he has to say about customer journey mapping. Cool. I see um, Borg, Borger Christensen actually shared a nice link um, in the chat. Um, if you go on the Teams chat, um, there's a book, Universal Methods of Design. Uh, okay. which covers 100 user research methods. So he says that might be a good resource for you to reference. Wonderful. Thank you, Borger. Okay, whilst this comes in, I'm going to move back into our slides. Right, everyone, I'd like to invite you back into the Microsoft Teams call. And so this has been your customer journey mapping masterclass presented by Yaku van den Heerfer and sponsored by Sand Dollar Design of UX Joburg. Okay, the prize will be uh, David Travis's The Ultimate Guide to Usability in UX. So I'd like to remind you to Drop in your questions before the day is over, and then we'll have a look at those and send out the winner tomorrow. Okay, so the next UX Joburg meetup, as I mentioned earlier, UX Joburg is now going to be fully remote for the foreseeable future. Uh, and our next meetup is going to be happening in June. And for that, we're going to be featuring Gary Greenfield from Interact RD, who's going to be speaking about selecting the correct type of research method during the user research phase. Invites are going to be sent out this next week, uh, but uh, book that slot now, and we're looking forward to seeing you then. Otherwise, that's it from me. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. 
Uh, it's been wonderful to spend time with you and uh, see your insights in the practical section and see your questions coming through. If you'd like to ask Yaku any more questions, you can reach out to him on Twitter. Uh, and my name is Jonathan. It's been a pleasure being with you this evening. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at future UX Joburg meetups. Have a great evening. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.